choir. Our scripture reading today is taken from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, and I'll be reading from the first chapter, first verses 1 through 4, and then continuing with verses 11 through 12. Hear then now the word of God. From Paul, Savanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we must always thank God for you. This is only right because your faithfulness is growing by leaps and bounds and the love that all of you have for each other is increasing. And that's why we ourselves are bragging about you in God's churches. We tell about your endurance and faithfulness in all the harassments and trouble that you have put up with. And then verse 11, we are constantly praying for you for this, that our God will make you worthy of his calling and accomplish every good desire and faithful work by his power. And then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored by you and you will be honored by him consistent with the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reading of scripture. May God bless us with understanding upon hearing God's word. Amen. This is a, a phrase that maybe many of you have uh, used. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Uh, maybe you've said it. Maybe you've written it down. If you're on Facebook, you've probably seen it from time to time. And that phrase is thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. It's a phrase that's been out there for quite a while, but it's gotten some recent attention lately. For quite a while, that phrase seemed to be a pretty good combination of words. You know, prayers, which was simply a shorthanded way of saying that, you know, all of us who are of the religious bent are in sympathy with you, and we are speaking to God through all of your trouble and what you are going through. And thoughts would indicate to those who maybe weren't quite as religious and they were feeling for you too. Thoughts and prayers. But more recently, that is a phrase that has been coming under some uh, attention and in some places denounced as a simple platitude that is used in place of any meaningful action. Thoughts and prayers and then go on with your life. Just say the words and then that's enough, that's done, I'm done with it. So on one side, the words are seen as an expression of humility, an expression of helplessness, as a way of saying, you know, there is nothing that I can do in the face of what has happened but I stand with you, stand together, and I pray God's comfort for those who are hurting. On the other side is that the words have simply become disassociated from, again, any meaningful action. They are more like some kind of verbal junk food. You say the words, but there's nothing behind them. I can go back to my life now. I got my thoughts and prayers in. Off I go. That brings us to the reading today. And the reading gives us Paul's view of this whole idea of thought and, and prayer. There, right there in 2 Thessalonians, way back then. And it actually may give us a whole new way to look at thought and to look at prayer, or what we might even want to call some thoughtful prayer. In the, uh, this is an interesting text that we read because it's divided up into two sections. And in the first section of the reading, Paul is making pretty clear to his readers that they are indeed in his thoughts. That he is indeed thinking about those Thessalonian people and what it is that they're going through. But the thing is, is Paul gets very specific. He says that his companion, he says about them that he's giving thanks. He's giving thanks 
to God because of them, because of their faith that is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for, uh, for each other is increasing. He gets specific with his thinking. His thoughts are concrete. And it's obvious by what he says right here in these first verses that Paul has spent some time thinking about these folks. He's thinking about them as he addresses them in this letter. The second part that we get to in, in verse 11, well, but that's where Paul tells them that they're, guess what, they're also in his prayers. But again, it's not some general, I'll say a little prayer for you. It's not that. It's very specific. It's concrete. And he says, we always pray for you, asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good work and resolve and work of faith so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. Very specific. What Paul does, Paul spells out his thoughts. And Paul spells out his prayers. And in doing so, and because Paul actually has a relationship with them, there is a real ring of sincerity to it. There is a real genuineness to it. It's a genuine expression of feelings toward those folks in Thessalonica who are going through some tough times of their own. So here's what Paul does. Paul actually shows us how to put meat on the bones of thoughts. Paul shows us how to put meat on the bones of prayer. That no matter how helpless we may feel when we want to express that togetherness, that solidarity with somebody who's going through maybe some really great loss in their lives. And no matter that we know, we know that words alone will not suffice. Those genuine, those sincere, those relational thoughts those relational prayers, those genuine prayers, they are most certainly not nothing. But here's one thing about what thoughts are. And what we find in scripture is that thoughts are work. They are work. Because what they do when they are genuine and when they are sincere is that they push us to view what's happening not from our own perspective but of the view of those who are being directly affected by what's going on. We change our viewpoint. That's what real thoughts do. Thoughts are work. Sympathy, especially when they lead to us to consider if there's any concrete action that we just might do to support others in what they're going through or to support others in doing that work. Something that will help. Could the grieving person use a hand right now with the kids or an aging relative for whom they are the caregiver? Could they use that extra hand right now? Is there some task? Is there something that we could take off their plate for just a little bit of time? That's when we put thoughts to work. Thoughts are work. Prayerful thoughts are work. And prayer itself is also work. Because here was, here's what prayer does. If you say that your here's a, this is an easy one. If you say your prayers are with someone, pray for them. Actually pray for them. Sometimes we, you know, we, we may say prayers are, you know, a, I think prayers are with you, and then that's it. We're on with we're on to schnooks. If you, pray, if you say, you know, that, that my prayers are with you, then, 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 then pray for them. And when we do that, here's what we do. We put ourselves in a place to see beyond our own personal horizons. And we walk in someone else's shoes, at least for a while. Because what genuine prayer does is it deepens our empathy. And it puts us in a place, just this is it, where God can change us. Our prayers for others puts us in a place where God can change you and where God can change me. And by changing us, 
it leads us into taking some action, some action that we can take to make things better. You know, though all good things come from God, praying for others assumes that God may actually allow our prayers to be a means by which God does good for others. We may be the vessel. We, 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 we know we have a relationship with God. And if we, if we have this relationship with God, then what our prayer is, is an event in that relationship. It may not be a decisive event. It may not change the course of the world. But what it is, is a very essential element and a new one that we bring into the situation, no matter how tough and awful that situation may be. Because it's asking for God's help. And what greater source of help actually is there than God? So in times of, of tragedy and in times of hurt and in times of struggle and pain, whether it affects many or whether it is, you know, affects just a few, a combination of genuine, sincere thought, prayer, thoughtful prayer will never be the whole answer. But oftentimes, it is all we've got in the moment. Writing about the difficulties of life, author Anne Lamott said this. And I think we can kind of relate. I can relate. It's funny. I always imagined when I was a kid that adults had some kind of inner toolbox full of shiny tools, the saw of discernment, the hammer of wisdom, the sandpaper of patience. She said, but when I grew up, I found that life handed you these rusty, bent, old tools of friendships and prayer and conscience and honesty. And they said, do the best you can with these because they'll have to do. And then she writes, and mostly against all odds, they are enough. God has given us thoughtful prayer. It is work. And it is a contained in what is that seemingly inadequate box of tools, and we are told to do our best with them. So the genuine thought and that sincere prayer, that thoughtful prayer, when offered and then when followed through on, most certainly are never nothing. Because they are always ways that God has given us to love our neighbor. All glory be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.